Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, um, so um, uh, we are fortunate of having uh, Jose uh, Polo Gomez uh, from the University of Waterloo uh, speaking about work that he has been doing recently with uh, uh, Luis Garay uh, from the uh, from Madrid, the Complutense University, and Eduardo Martin Martinez in, in, in Waterloo. I think Eduardo is your PhD advisor, uh, right, Jose? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, right. And, and I know Eduardo and Luis uh, well, and I saw uh, this work uh, in the archive. It's about um, um, relativistic quantum information, and I thought it was very, very interesting, very well written. And I invited them to give a talk, and, and lucky for us, Jose accepted. Uh, so, uh, Jose, the audience is, is yours, and, and thank you for, for accepting. Uh, um, go ahead. Well, thank you, thank you, Ivan, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, so, well, yes, uh, good morning, everybody. As, as Ivan said, uh, my name is Jose Polo Gomez. Um, I am currently a first year PhD student at Eduardo Martin Martinez Research Group, Barrio RQI at the University of Waterloo. And today I wanted to talk to you about how we can build a measurement theory for quantum fields using particle detectors. The content of the talk is um, mainly based on, a, on an article written in collaboration with Luis Garay and Eduardo Martin Martinez that is currently available in archive and is uh, being reviewed, being peer reviewed now. So, um, sorry. Yeah. So this is the structure of, of my talk. I will first start introducing, well, explaining what do we mean when we talk about the measurement problem in quantum field theory. Then I will review what particle detectors are and how do they fit within QFT. After that, I will focus on the actual content of the paper the talk is based on. By first introducing the setup, then presenting the measurement procedure that we consider there, and obtaining the update of the state of the field uh, that we get after the measurement has been performed. After reviewing the difference between selective and non-selective measurements, I will study in particular non-selective measurements for reasons I will explain later. I will also discuss and um, prescribe an update rule for the measurement scheme I present here. And finally, I will wrap up the content of all the talk uh, in order to hopefully show that the measurement framework that I will present is a proper measurement theory with all the features that we should ask a measurement theory to have. So before getting into the talk, I wanted to emphasize that this work is part of a research line that has been conducted in Eduardo Martin Martinez group for many years now. Besides external collaborators as Luis Garay himself, uh, here in this slide, we have the people in the group that are working or have worked on this problem uh, before. Apart from Eduardo and myself, Jose de Ramon and Maria Papa Giorgio are PhD students in their final years. Richard Love and Daniel J. Grimmer are former PhD students, although Daniel is uh, currently part of the group in the form of a postdoctoral visitor, uh, while he's also doing a PhD in philosophy of physics at the University of Oxford. Finally, Bruno Torres and Rick Persch are second year PhD students uh, in the group right now. So without further ado, let's start. The first thing we should ask ourselves is why do we need a measurement theory at all? Well, in any physical theory, we should be able to describe how we gather information from the physical systems we are, uh, we are studying. Uh, that is to say that we need to be able to describe how we measure. In classical physics, we don't have a measurement theory because it is hidden under the assumption that we can measure classical systems without affecting them at all. Uh, so we do have a measurement theory that says that we can measure everything and that after the measurement, the physical state of the system is exactly the same as the one that was before the measurement was performed. Now, as you all know, in quantum mechanics, this is no longer the case. And describing measurements has, has been a, an op, uh, a problem since its very beginning, and it's still an open problem. However, in the case of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, this problem can be overcome in practice by the use of projective measurements and Luther's rule, which tells us that after the measurement, the state of the system is the projection of the initial state over the eigenspace associated to the outcome of the measurement. Now, the question is, can we do the same in quantum field theory? 
The first person to address this problem was uh, Raphael Sorkin in 1993 in a seminal paper called Impossible Measurements on Quantum Fields. In that paper, he showed that if we have two observers, A and C, who are space-like separated, and we perform a projective measurement in a thick uh, space-like hypersurface that touches A's causal future and C's causal past, then suddenly A and C are able to communicate, even though they are causally disconnected. At first, one may think that the reason for this is that one rank projectors, uh, as the one that Sorkin uses in his paper, uh, are non-local in quantum field theory. Indeed, local projections in quantum field theory are all infinite dimensional. However, this is not the reason at all. Um, as Borstein, you, and Kells uh, showed in a recent paper, um, even if we use local projections uh, that may be supported only in a bounded region B, it suffices that B touches uh, A's causal future and C's causal past for A and C to be able to communicate in general. Um, now, this, this of course uh, is telling us that modeling measurements in, with projections in quantum field theory uh, is incompatible with relativity. Uh, and therefore it is inconsistent with the very framework of quantum field theory. This is a huge problem because it leaves us with, uh, without a measurement theory for quantum fields. In order to try and give uh, a solution to this problem, the first thing we have to think about is what are the conditions that we should ask a measurement framework to fulfill? Well, first of all, a measurement framework should produce definite values. In measurements uh, at the end of the chain, uh, we get results that can be written down in a notepad. We get definite values, if anything, with some uncertainties. And the measurement framework should be able to reproduce this. Second, it should tell us the state of the system after the measurement. It is true that there are plenty of measurement protocols in which we just get rid of the system after we perform measurements on them. But uh, this, is, this might not be the, the case in general, and we might want to describe or even interact with the system after the measurement takes place. So even, if, even though we may not be able to describe what happens to the system during the measurement, uh, we should be able to say what state it is left after it takes place. This is what we call update rules. Third, it should be consistent with the theory it is designed for. In the case of quantum field theory, uh, this means that it should be consistent with relativity and therefore it has to be covariant and respect causality. And last but not least, for a measurement framework to be of any practical use at all, it should be a good model for real experiments that take place within a real lab. Now for the case of projections, I'm so sorry. Um, I forgot to, to deactivate notifications on the phone. Okay. No. Sorry for that. <clears throat> so uh, for the case of projections that we considered before, we saw that the main problem was that they weren't consistent with the theory. So an interesting approach to provide a valid measurement framework is to try and formulate the measurement framework within quantum field theory to avoid any kind of inconsistency. This is precisely the case, the case of the fuster vieux framework, which was proposed by Chris Fuster and René Vieux uh, in, in the work referenced there. This is a measurement theory that is entirely formulated within quantum field theory using its algebraic for, uh, formulation, uh, which is uh, uh, so-called AQFT. So uh, since it is formulated within quantum field theory, the probe that we use to measure the quantum field of interest is another quantum field. It is also fully relativistic and safe from any kind of inconsistency. Now we argue that this measurement framework also has limitations. Uh, first of all, the origin of the problem was the fact that we did not know how to measure quantum fields. Now it is fair to say that if we let uh, the quantum field of interest uh, interact with a probe quantum field, then the probe is going to gain information from, that, from the first quantum field. However, we are still left with the problem of how do we retrieve the information that that probe has, uh, has gained. Uh, we are left with the problem of how do we measure the probe. Also another problem is the fact that real measurement apparatuses are not free quantum fields. They are usually bound systems and the treatment of bound states in quantum field theory is still very much of an open problem. It is uh, worth mentioning that both in the original paper and in later works, 
local free field modes have been proposed uh, to model localized probes. However, it has been shown that these models do not capture the behavior of realistic measurement apparatuses. Thus, it seems that the Fuster V framework, um, even though it is a very interesting um, measurement proposal, at least for now, does not provide a completely satisfactory answer to the problem we are, we are facing. Another approach to this problem is use, and the one, the approach I'm going to advocate for is using particle detectors. But what is a particle detector? Particle detectors are localized non-relativistic quantum systems that are coupled through a quantum field. An example of this is the unruh weight model uh, whose uh, interaction Hamiltonian is shown there. I will later comment on the terms of this formula, but for now I'm only interested in the fact that mu is a monopole uh, operator for the detector and phi is the field operator. And therefore this interaction Hamiltonian shows a linear coupling between the detector and the field. Other examples of physical systems that can be modeled as particle detectors are atoms and photo detectors. It is worth clarifying that when I say non-relativistic quantum systems, I mean systems that in their proper reference frame can be modeled and described appropriately with non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I do not mean that these systems do not have um, relativistic speeds with respect to some particular lab reference frame. So particle detectors are non-relativistic quantum systems. So the question is, how do they fit in our will to provide a measurement framework for QFT? And in particular, how do they fit within QFT at all? I mean, can we actually couple a non-relativistic quantum system with a field in a way that is consistent with QFT? Well, this article by Mar Eduardo Martin Martinez, Felipe Persia, and Bruno Torres uh, shows that particle detectors can couple covariantly. Indeed, they give a covariant version of the Hamilton interaction Hamiltonian I, I gave before in the form of the Hamiltonian density that is displayed in this slide. In particular, this lambda function tells us where the support of the interaction within in space-time uh, is. Um, in particular, in the, in the reference frame, the proper reference frame of the detector, this lambda function can be split in the product of the switching function and the, uh, the smearing function of the detector, right? chi and F. Another important result uh, is the fact uh, that particle detectors evolve causally. So when we couple, we couple a particle detector and a quantum field, the joint evolution of both systems uh, takes place in a way that is perfectly consistent with quantum field theory. In particular, they do not allow uh, signaling. In the reference by Jose de Ramon, Maria Pobagiorgiu, and Eduardo Martin Martinez, the, uh, they also studied the impossible measurement problem by considering uh, a third ancillary detector between two, uh, two detectors. Uh, and it's, it is shown that the supernominal signaling between the two main detectors is under control since it doesn't show up until uh, subleading order. In fact, it shows up at all because we allow those detectors to be smeared in extended regions of space-time. For four-point light detectors, for example, um, this uh, doesn't happen at all. They are completely safe from any causality violation, not in the form uh, of impossible measurements, not in their evolution. Finally, particle detectors have been shown to be capable to reproduce reali realistic experiments. In particular, unruh de detectors are able to capture the main features of light matter interaction when, when there is no exchange of angular momentum involved in the phenomenon. Moreover, the regimes in which the unruh de model is a good approximation and the regimes in which it has to be refined in order to reproduce all the features of the, interest in, of the phenomenon of interest is quite well understood. So all these results are a strong motivation for us to try and complete a measurement framework that is based on the use of particle detectors. And that is precisely what we did in, in the paper that, that I'm, I'm talking about in, in the talk. So um, in this paper, we consider the simplest setup that we could, uh, that is, we consider a Minkowski spacetime and in, the, uh, and in it, a real scalar field coupled to a stationary two level Unruh detector. In particular, since the Unruh detector is stationary, then we can take its proper time to be just the coordinate time of, uh, of the Minkowski spacetime, and therefore we can, um, we can express the interaction Hamiltonian in the, in the same form I showed before. Here, lambda is the, the constant associated to the strength of the coupling. Chi is the switching function that tells us when the interaction is switched on and switched off and 
how this trend evolves in time. F of X is this mirroring function that tells us where the, the detector and the, and the field in space can interact. Uh, and well, phi is the field operator and mu is the monopole operator for the, for the detector, which uh, well, uh, is shown below in the interaction picture where D and E are the ground and excited states and omega is the energy gap of the two level quantum system. So now when we propose the, the measurement scheme uh, is when we are going to take full advantage of the fact that particle detectors are non-relativistic quantum systems. Because in, or in a standard quantum mechanics, we, as I, said, as I said before, we know how to model measurements that is using PBMs and Luther's rule. So even though we know that performing projective measurements uh, is, um, is still defined for quantum fields, what we are going to do here is to let the detector interact with the field so that the detector gains information from the field. And then we are going to perform a projective measurement on the detector. And it is precisely what is, uh, what is told uh, in, in, in this slide. First, we consider an initially uncorrelated state of the detector on the field. In particular, we assume that the detector is in a pure state just for simplicity. It is immediately generalized to the, to the case in which it is a mixed state. Then we let the detector and the field interact in a finite interval <clears throat> so that the final state is just the, the usual one determined by the unitary operator U. And finally, we perform a projective measurement on the detector so that the final joint system is the one that, that is provided by Luther's rule. Um, however, we have to keep in mind that we are interested on on, on getting a measurement framework for quantum fields. So the particle detector is an ancillary element and we do not want, in general, we may not want it uh, in the picture. So what we do is to trace out the detector and see what the effect of the measurement, uh, um, what, what is the effect of the measurement on the field. Uh, and by measurement here, I mean the whole procedure, not only the, the, the projective measurement on the detector, but also the previous interaction. So not surprisingly, uh, the interaction and the PVM on the detector yield a POVM on the field that is a positive, or uh, positive operator value measurement. Uh, it is not surprising because this already happens in, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So in particular, if the, if the projector associated to the outcome of the measurement is, uh, is the one over the, um, over the state S of the two-dimensional field, um, of the, of the two-dimensional Hilbert space of the detector, then the updated state of the field uh, associated to that outcome S and the initial state of the detector Psi is given by this expression where DM operators give in particular the operator E where E is, uh, is M dagger M and is what we actually call the POVM. Uh, it, it is worth mentioning that, that, the, that this average of the E operator is exactly the probability of getting S as an outcome uh, when we perform the measurement. So um, now here we have, uh, we have seen that, um, that we can perform a predictive measurement detector and we have performed perform all the calculation. This is the mechanical part of it. However, we saw that performing, um, performing projection, predictive measurements on quantum fields lead, uh, led to, to causality violations. But there are in principle no reasons to believe that this cannot happen when we do the same on the detectors. Uh, so we have to check that performing a projective measurement on the detector is uh, consistent with relativity. And in particular, that it does not allow signaling. In order to do so, what we have to study is non-selective non, non measurements. And um, I'm going to review the difference between selective and non-selective measurements in order to, um, to see why this is the case, why we only have to consider non-selective measurement in order to analyze uh, the um, the, the compatibility with the relativity of the, of the measurement scheme. Now, a non-selective measurement uh, takes place when the measurement, the operation that, that involves the measurement is performed, but the outcome is either not known or we don't check it. So if we don't know the outcome of the measurement, the result is a mixed updated state. That is a, a mixture of all the possible updates weighted by, by their respective uh, probabilities. Um, in the case of a selective measurement, uh, we do check what the outcome of the measurement is, and we perform a, an update that is based, that is consistent with, with that outcome, with all the post-selection. 
So in, in the, in the non-latinistic example of a stenger lag uh, experiment in which we measure whether uh, a system in this initial state is, um, uh, has its spin, uh, the, 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 the set component of the spin up or down. In the case of a non-selective measurement, we have this mixed state because we have a, um, a one-fourth uh, probability of getting plus and a three-fourths of getting minus. And in the case of a selective measurement, well, if we get plus, it should be just the, 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 um, the pure state that tells us that the spin is up. And uh, if, if we get minus, well, it's the pure state too. So in particular, why uh, are no selective measurements those that we need to, uh, to study in order to check uh, the, compatibility, the compatibility with relativity? Well, the thing is that if we want to check if there is signaling, then what we have is someone performing the, the measurement in one region. And uh, we want to see if that measurement signals to another observer that may be in a space like separated region. Now that observer, um, at, at most can have access to the fact that this person is, um, is performing a measurement, maybe because they have agreed upon it before. However, what it is for sure is that this observer does not have access to the outcome of the measurement. Therefore, um, if they are modeling the state of the, of the system, of the field in particular in any way, they have to apply a non-selective update because they do not know the, the outcome of the measurement. And that's why uh, for checking if we can signal uh, to, to a space like separated observers, the update that we have to consider for those observers is always at, not, is always at most non-selective. So in the case of the, of, the, of the setup that we are considering, the detector is just a two-level system and therefore we can write the identity in this way where S and R are from a state uh, of, the, of the Hilbert space and are associated to, the, to two different outcomes of the measurement we are performing. Therefore, the updated field state is, as I said before, just a mixture of the two possible update, updates weighed by the probability of getting, getting S and R, where, as I said before, these probabilities are precisely the averages of the POVM operators, the E's. Therefore, the, the updated state in this case is just this state. However, uh, in this particular case, since uh, since we only have two, these two states that, that make up the, the, the identity for the detector system, this, uh, this uh, state can in fact be expressed as just a trace over the detector of this expression. And therefore, when we are calculating an operator, the, the, the expectation value of an operator for the field, we just have to perform this trace, but, this, but since this state can be expressed this way, we can also write this expression for the average, for, for the expectation value. Now, if A is an operator that is supported in a region that is space-like separated from the interaction region, then A is going to commute with all the field operators that are in the unitary, that are involved in the unitary operator U. And therefore, U is, well, of course, the identity for the detector is going to commute with any detector operator that is in U, and therefore, U and, and this tensor operator are going to commute. Thus, we can just, uh, swap these two operators, the unitary operators cancel, and, and we are left with the, the result that the expectation value of operators that are space-like support that are supported in regions space-like separated from the interaction from the from the region in which the measurement takes place are not changed at all. And therefore, and this guarantees that the measurement scheme that we have designed doesn't signal. Also, it is not an impossible measurement in the same control way as the interaction itself. Since the measurement already involves the interaction, it can have some superluminal signaling, but it is controlled in the same way as the interaction was. And there is no superluminal signaling at all in the case in which we consider point light detectors, which is uh, uh, an evidence that the, that the superluminal signal, if, if anything, it comes from the interaction and not from the actual performance of the projective measurement on the detector. So, after analyzing the non, -measure, the non selective measurement, I, well, in the article, it is also analyzed the selective update. I'm not going to show here the calculations because they are messy, although they are not complicated at all. But what we get is that the selective update does affect the expectation values of observables that are supported in regions that are space like separated from, from the region of the measurement. This shouldn't be surprising at all. Uh, because there are correlations in, in the field. However, uh, we think that an update rule for selective measurements 
on the one hand, should include the knowledge of the measurement outcome uh, in the description of the field. And so that if we perform sequential measurements, uh, they implement the compatibility with the previous, with the previous measurements, but it, it should also be compatible with relativity. Even though they are correlations, the update rule is intended to mimic the effect of the measurement that are actual physical operations uh, on the field. And for us, it doesn't make sense that, um, that, they, that they affect observables that are space-like separated from the measurement region. So it seems that we have a problem if we update the, um, the, 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 density, the density operator and that describes the state of the field globally. One, one, pers one approach that one could think of, uh, sorry? Just one clarification. In the in the previous slide, you were using uh, a concrete uh, updated state, right? Yes, but it's uh, the so the non it's the non selective uh, the non selective uh, update. And now, in the next part of the talk, are you gonna uh, 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 question that, or are you gonna? No, sorry. Uh, if I didn't express myself clearly, uh, I'm now I'm talking about selective updates that are these states in particular, this row S and row R. Or, or any else. So you want to explore other possibilities for the update? The non-selective one works well, right? Yeah, the, the, the non-selective one works well, but it's also the one I have to care about. If I want to check if the actual physical procedure that I have, uh, uh, that I have proposed is compatible with relativity. Now, what we are talking, what we are talking about, what I, I was talking about now, it's about selective measurements. In selective measurements, uh, we are not talking about whether the projective measurement of the detector produces uh, causality violations anymore, but whether the update rule that we are using for modeling the effect of the selective measurement is compatible with relativity or not. So there is a difference between the case in which we are actually just considering the physical procedure, the non-selective, which is the non-selective measurement, um, and when we are considering the, the update rule that involves uh, taking into account the outcome of the measurement. Is that, is, uh, is that clear enough? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thanks. So um, yeah, the thing is that when we analyze the selective, uh, the selective update, that is the, the, the row, I'm uh, sorry here, the row as psi, for example, we see that when we calculate the expectation values of operators that are supported outside uh, the causal support of the interaction region, they do change. So even though this is, as I said, this is uh, something to expect because there are correlations in the field. Um, in our opinion, this is something to avoid because the upgrade rule should mimic the effect that the measurement has uh, on the quantum field. So we do think that it should be completely compatible with relativity. It does seem that if we apply a global update when we, to, to, the, to the density operator for the quantum field when we are measuring selectively, we, we are going to incur in this kind, of, uh, this kind of difficulty. So one approach that one may think of uh, at first is to consider that maybe we can, we can update rho only in the causal future or something like that. However, um, this is not possible because rho is not a it's not a it's not a quantity that naturally depends on regions of space time. It's just a density operator. So, for example, if we wanted to calculate some um, some the, the, the expectation values of operators that are supported in different regions of space time, uh, for example, one that is in the causal future and one that is outside the causal support of the, of the measurement, then there is no natural way of calculating those uh, um, those expectation values because we only know how to do that with a single uh, density operator. So it seems that we have to give up uh, the concept of having a universal row that describes the state of the field. Instead of that, the update that we consider is contextual in the sense, in the sense that it's context dependent. We, 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 we prescribe that the update depends, is, that the update, the update is dependent of, of the observer and it depends on the information that is available to that observer in particular in a certain point of space time. So the whole update rule can be summarized in three points. First, if an experimenter performs a PVM on a detector uh, that, it that has been coupled uh, to a quantum field, then the experimenter should apply a selective or a non-selective update in, the in his future, in their future, sorry, his or her future, 
um, depending on whether uh, they have checked or not uh, the the outcome of the of the measurement. If there if there are space like measurements, they do not affect each other uh, because the updates of the experimenter take place only in their in their causal futures. Moreover, since this is since this this update depends only on the information that is available. Um, if an observer receives information about a measurement that they do not necessarily have performed, then they have to, they have to do exactly the same selective or non-selective update uh, according to, to the outcome that they have, well, the information that they have received. Now, we can perform a sanity check to see that, first of all, this update rule is consistent and that it does account for the correlations that are present in the field. It is consistent, first of all, first of all because if, if this update rule is based on the information that is available the, uh, for, for a certain observer, then if we have A and B performing space-like separated measurements, and eventually they get into a region in which they both have access to, to both measurements, then they have exactly the same information and the state of the field that they should, that they should have, they should have, yeah, the state of the, the, the way they should be describing the field should be exactly the same. So and this indeed this happens because, for example, if uh, if we are if we study A, then after A performs uh, their measurement, um, they can well they, they have to update the state in this form if the measurement is selective, <clears throat> and after uh, coming into into contact with B's uh, measurement information, uh, they have to update they have to perform exactly the same update. However, the fact that A and B are space like separated. Allows us to uh, allows us to say that these m operators commute, and in the end we can check that this row a b is equal to this row b a in the case uh, in the analogous case in which we perform exactly the same calculations for b. In particular, we can show uh, in the form of this formula that correlations are accounted for because this formula can be read as the probability for a to get here uh, the information that b has uh, has measured b, uh, little b, is exactly the probability of uh, measuring a and b divided by the probability of measuring a at first, which is exactly the, the formula of conditional probability. And in particular, this is different from just the plain probability of getting, of getting result a, uh, b, sorry. So with this contextual update rule in which we have mm, give up, we have given up the the universal uh, density operator, and we have made things dependent of what measure, what observers measure, and the correlations between them. It is natural that we can adapt this this measurement this measurement scheme uh, to algebraic quantum field theory because this is precisely what the algebraic formulation does: it is uh, focusing on, on on correlations and expectation values. So indeed, we can. Uh, we can formulate formally uh, the, this update in the form of updates of endpoint functions, which are just the, um, the expectation values of product uh, uh, field operators in the particular space-time points uh, of their arguments. For the non-selective measurement, it is clear because we have seen that the non-selective measurement does not affect space-like regions at all. So it doesn't matter uh, what x1 or xn are, we can always update the, 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 the endpoint function using the updated state uh, for the non-selective measurement. Uh, and of course, in the case in which these uh, points are all outside uh, the causal super of interaction region, then this is just going to be the initial uh, endpoint function. However, what happens with, like, with selective measurements? Because, because we have seen that these affect uh, the, the, the space-like separated regions. And in fact, these were the, re the, the reasons uh, the reason for us to, to reject a non-contextual update rule. In the case of one-point functions, uh, we only have one argument um, in, the, in the function. So it seems reasonable, reasonable that if here in this picture P is the causal future of the projective measurement in particular, then if X1 is in the, it's within P, then X1 is in a region in which the information of the outcome of the measurement is accessible, and therefore it makes sense that we consider the selectively updated state. However, if X1 is outside P, either in the pale blue region or even completely space-like separated from the interaction region of the detector, 
um, then um, we should um, we should um, we should update the, well we should consider the non-selective update and this is precisely what is uh, reflected here here if x1 is in the future of the measurement then we consider the the, the selective update and if uh, it is not then we can just consider the non-selective the non-selective case that i provided before now when we have more than one point the situation gets messier right because now we can have for example um, well of course if both points are space like separated from the interaction region, then it's, uh, it seems clear that we shouldn't consider the update at all. If both are inside and they both have access to the information uh, of the outcome of the measurement, then it makes sense that we consider the selective update. However, what happens when we have mixed arguments? So that we have uh, X1 that has access to the measurement outcome and next to that doesn't have access to it. Well, in this case, we have to read, what we do is um, making the following argument. For that two point function to, to show up in the modeling of, a measure of, of an experiment at all, um, this experiment, the information, the outcome of this experiment has to be processed in a region that, it, that is both in the causal future of X2 and in the causal future of X1. Of course, if, if we are doing something at F, in X2 and doing something in X1 and then uh, whatever was in X2 goes further away and doesn't come into causal contact with X1 at all, then it doesn't make sense for X1 to ask what happened to X2 because it, that's something that is not going to affect X1. Uh, well, not X1, but whatever was you know, performing operations in X1. So our argument is that for a two-point function with two mixed arguments to be relevant at all, it has to be processed in a region that is in both causal futures. And that region, if it is in the causal future of X1, in particular has access to the outcome of the measurement. And therefore, what we say is that since we are analyzing the experiment in that processing region, then we should consider the selective update because in that region, we have access to the outcome of the measurement. And that's precisely what we say here. If X1 or X2 are in P at all, then we have to consider the selective update. If both are outside it, then we consider the non-selective one. And of course, this argument can be strictly forwardly generalized to endpoint functions in general. Now, uh, to finish, I want to wrap up all the content. I have presented all the features of our measurement framework. I have uh, presented um, the, the setup, how the measurement uh, is performed, and I have given an update rule. So what I want to show, I want to argue now, that is that this measurement framework has fulfills all the conditions that I, I, I talked about at the, in the beginning. So first, it produces definite values because we are performing a projective measurement detector and we get, uh, we get S or we get R, but we definitely get something that we can write down. It also tells us the state of the system after the measurement because we have provided an update rule. It is also consistent with the theory because we have seen, well, we have seen references that show that, that, the, that the evolution was covariant and causal. And we have seen also that the update is causal. And finally, it reproduces experiments because as we have seen, uh, we have said before, uh, it captures the features of uh, light matter interaction under certain conditions. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And now, if you have any questions. Thank you, Jose, for, for the talk uh, and for finishing in 40 minutes with so much information. <laughs> uh, that is always, always good. Uh, so, uh, if anybody has uh, a question, please uh, go ahead. I can start myself with 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 a question. Um, um, I mean, I need to process all, all the information, uh, but 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 I mean, the most important part was the this last part, the the updated rule, uh, uh, and. Uh, and the statement that that you know if you want to pay attention to points that are initially space like se separated uh, uh, and out of one is inside the causal future of the interaction region the other is outside uh, that all what we care about in physics is the correlations whenever both enter into the causal future of the uh, uh, i am a bit shocked by that right because um, uh, 
Uh, so I, I'm not sure I am understanding it well. So would that mean that, for instance, if you know, if you are in a uh, in our universe, I know our universe is not Minkowski space time, but because <laughs> because all these shouldn't be a lot of difference. So. Uh, uh, so 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 then let me ask in in uh, first in Minkowski space time. That, does it mean that if I want to know what are the correlations or entanglement? Entanglement entropy or whatever I want between uh, the initial, the, the, po the two points at the initial time, that is a meaningless question, which is an interesting to, uh, to, to physics or? Well, no, I'm not saying that it's, it, it is a meaningless question. The fact is that what I'm saying is that if you ask that question, mm -hmm. um, in physics, we actually kind of, we care about question if, uh, questions if they are um, experimentally performable, I guess, right? Uh, I mean, if they are related to any experience that can happen in the natural world. So asking about correlations, about two points that, about two things that to, to, um, to phenomena that took place in space-like uh, regions and that do not came into contact at all. Um, yes, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't make sense because if you are, if you are asking for those correlations, then you can ask for them theoretically, but then you have to perform an experiment in which you kind of check if the correlations that we, you were predicting theoretically were right. So if you, if you measure those correlations, then you have to process that measurement, that, that experiment for, for, some, for, for performing that experiment, you have to process the information of that experiment in a region that is in the, in the future of both. Uh, so um, what, I mean, what, what, I mean, what I meant with that argument is that if you have a detector Performing operations in a region that is space-like separated from the detector, from the from the from the measurement, and then you have another detector performing operations in the region that is in the causal future of the measurement. And now this detector that is space-like separated, it measures something and then it, it accelerates and goes into a real wedge. And the the detector in X one that 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 measures something in the in, in P uh, doesn't know anything else uh, about about this other detector. Then how are you supposed, you, you can ask for the correlations between, the two, um, between those two detectors, but how are you supposed to check that your prediction is right? You actually need some region that has access to both, to both of them. If you want to check the correlations, if you want yeah. to measure them, you need to perform an experiment in which there is something, a processor, an ex another experimenter, whatever, that comes into contact with both, uh, with both detectors. Yes. So my point is not that it doesn't make sense to ask about, um, about um, the correlations between two, these two detectors. My point is that, well, I guess, yes, it doesn't make sense in the sense that you cannot measure that. I mean, you cannot measure uh, the correlations between two detectors that never come into, uh, uh, into causal contact, uh, not never come, but that they, do not, that, they not, that do not communicate at all um, with a uh, common and you cannot compute it with your with your set of rules, right? Uh, well, uh, with um, my set of rules, yes, that that is not something that uh, that can be computable. So the philosophy is that if I ask you, you know, what is the correlation in the quantum field between here and Andromeda at this instant of time, you would say, I don't know how to compute it, but I don't care either uh, uh, because that is not a physical question. Is that the statement? Um, that's it. If you say, I mean, well, that, that's it in the case that you say, in which you say that you are not going to measure the correlations, well, maybe in whatever years afterwards uh, you need for Andromeda to get some information to us. I mean, it's like, what I mean is that if you're asking about the correlations between us and Andromeda right now, then mm -hmm. right now I can't answer that. But if you wait some number of years, then we are going to get information from Andromeda. Maybe you mm -hmm. can measure those correlations. So for me, that question makes sense because Andromeda is not, um, it's not going away. Um, so um, yeah, in, that, in, in that sense, we are, still in, we are still able to get information from Andromeda. It's not because Andromeda, sorry. Yeah, because I, I was, maybe I wasn't clear in the thing that I don't, I don't expect detector, both detectors to be actually in, like to reach the, exp the, processor, the processing region. But, but at least I would expect them to send for example, light signals to the processing region. So in the end, yeah, processing right. region, yeah. So mm -hmm. it, 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 might, it, it might make sense uh, to, to measure the correlations between Andromeda and, 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 and ourselves right now, because we can perform an experiment in the future that measures that. 
But if Andromeda was accelerating away in, uh, at a speed that didn't allow us to, in 10 years, uh, uh, measure the, um, in, in X years to measure those correlations, then yes, I would say that that doesn't make sense because it's not a physical question. It's not something that I can contrast at all. I don't know if, you uh, to if that uh, makes sense I'm, I'm okay. to you. Oh. You were muted, so I was wondering. No, no, I, 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 I understand. I was not criticizing. I was just trying no, no, to yes, understand. Yes. I mean, uh, it was basically like your question. So, yeah. Yeah, this was uh, one of the most subtle points of. Um, mm, yeah, I mean, it's basically just like if you have access to the measurement outcomes or not, or if okay. you have access to the detectors that are coupling to the field or not. Exactly. I mean. That's, um, that's, I, I know that the, this algebraic formalism uh, seems very formal and so on, but everything can be basically wrapped up with the with, with, with what, uh, what, what I said at the beginning with the, with the density operator approach. It is just a matter of where the information is available. Yeah. And that's basically it. Yeah. Yeah. So if we keep track of where the information is available, then we are going to do everything else. The thing is that that is precisely the point. When we update um, the, the the density operator, and that is something that, for example, is done in, in other in other measurement frameworks too. Um, we are updating on a condition. We are uh, it, it's it's a it's a matter of uh, it's it's a compatibility condition in terms of conditional probabilities. We are measuring and we are giving an a, a state that gives us the correct conditional probabilities probabilities yeah. that are conditioned on the outcome of the measurement. Given so that we know the measurement outcome. Yeah, of course. That's not, that. That's it. That, so, if, if you want observer observers to apply that update, you need to see where that condition is actually available. Yeah, and you have to get it. someone. They have to know the measurement outcome. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, the idea is simple. The idea is behind the behind the the, the whole the whole scheme is quite simple. Mm -hmm. More questions? I don't know if Ravi had any. Uh, he was um, unmuted and. You did again. Um, so, so I have another one, which is uh, what, uh, uh, Robbie. You want to say something? No, no, I don't. I just meant to say I don't. Okay. And um, um, what about uh, generalizations to core space spacetimes? Uh, well, in principle. I would say that um, the, um, as, as, as long as the space time is hyperbolic, um, this, this setup doesn't really depend on the fact that it is Minkowski. I mean, we, we, choose Minkowski, we chose Minkowski because it is simpler to do all the calculations, in particular for the, for the update. But if we say that we can prescribe the update in some way and we can perform the calculations, then the idea, the conceptual idea of the of the of the whole procedure is exactly the same. I mean, we we should instead of just having light cones for the for the futures, we would have just the causal um, the causal futures of the regions. But the the idea would be the same. Yeah, I think it's just. I mean, it just depends on the causal structure and how these exactly. things mm -hmm. can propagate. So um, that's it. Yeah. If the information is uh, is so sort of you can look at it just like like a classical idea of just classical information propagating because yeah. that's what the measurement outcomes are as soon as you perform a measurement it just becomes classical data so then you just look at the causal structure exactly that was actually one of the one of the conditions that we imposed that it produced definite values because we, what we are seeing is that the measurements in the end what we get is classical information yeah Any further question? Well, I just have a comment on that last one. I think from the perspective of QFT also, it is only the classical limit that you can talk about anything called measurement. Mm. The same classical aspect comes in because uh, what do we mean? And you say, you know, measure an atom, take even something simpler, an electron. What does it mean that my experimental colleague catches an electron? It means a certain amount of charge, a certain amount of mass, a certain angular momentum of a half h bar as a little lump. So it's the classical limit of 
the field of electron field that is measured. It is not anything else. Well, uh, I mean, I could argue that I can, that we have devices that interacts with, uh, interact with fields that are not just in their classical limits. Now, if what you mean is that when we measure, we are measuring classical limits, I can, yeah. I can, agree, I can agree with that because I mean, the, 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 the measurement scheme that I gave is, is classical. I mean, it's cl the, the, last, the last step is classical in the sense that uh, first we kind of take the step of making a quantum field interacting with a non-relativistic quantum system. And then we, we use the PVMs and Luther's rule that are the Heisenberg cut that take us from the quantum realm to, to the, classical, the classical step. So yes, of course, in the end, we have to take those steps up so that in the end we get classical information. So, but, but of course, we, for the systems we measure, we, we, we do can measure, like when we, when we measure like um, the electric fields and so on, we can measure things that are not uh, in their classical limit. I mean, they, of course, they, they, it makes sense for, a, for an atom to interact with, uh, with, a, mm, with a highly non-coherent state of, uh, of, the, of the electric field and that can be- Yeah, now you see, you mentioned electric field. Now that's because you're dealing with, with um, bosons of so spin one. That is why their classical limit, you can talk about electric and magnetic fields and so on. But if you have a fermion like an electron, the only classical limit is of a particle. There is no field classical limit. I think mm -hmm. that's the fundamental distinction, first of all, isn't there between a boson and a fermion. Sure, sure. In I mean, a, I, I took, I, sorry, sorry. Sorry that I interrupted. In a classical limit, I mean, this is why I specifically said electron. So if it's an electron, it's not the field that you measure at the end. You always measure the particle classical limit. Well, um, <clears throat> I could argue that, I mean, there are physical states. Uh... There are physical states of the electron. I mean, it has an electron QFT. I mean, it has a field theory. It has a field, but I'm saying that when it comes to measuring an electron, you're doing it in a classical limit. Of course, it could have done other things in between. You don't measure it, you can measure something else. But as soon as you, you say, however, finally, when you do a measurement, not an atom, that's why I said, as you had on your slide, but let's say an electron, which is a definite fermion, then the classical limit is only a particle, not a field. But for example, um, if, I, if I measure, if I let a, a, if, I, if I put a photo detector, well, a, a, a screen that would be a photo detector after a, a diffraction right. rate, uh, and I diffract the electrons, I would argue that this data that I'm measuring in the screen with the photo detectors is not the classical limit. No, I'm sorry, you you can't quite say that because on the on the screen, suppose I'm doing an experiment with a single electron, whatever number of slits I may have, on the screen. When you measure an electron, you always measure it as a classical particle. Yeah, a single a certain charge, mass, and spin. That is all I know to recognize an electron. Yes, now, it may have an interference pattern on that screen, but when you're measuring, you're always measuring a particle limit of the electron. Well, I, um, that is a subtle uh, point because for, for me, it is difficult to say where there is a... Um, I mean, why do you say that the? Um, why do you say that, that 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 what's happening is that we are measuring the classical limit of the of the electron instead of maybe saying that in principle you have an entanglement between the between a non-classical limit of the electron state and the screen, and when you measure the screen, then that then that that that, that is when you are actually performing a projection, a projective measurement on the screen. And then is, then is when the state of the screen uh, takes the, the classical form that it would have if, if, the, if the electron would, um, if, if you have just uh, like shot an electron into the screen. Yeah, but anytime so, you introduce a projection, that's where you could, you could say it's entanglement uh, every way, all the way down. Yes, but there's I mean, a so As soon as you say, I'm gonna measure, so you say the electrons entangled with the screen, but then you say I measure the screen with well, my measurement device. You could say my measurement device is entangled with the uh, screen and it's entanglement all the way down. So that's what he's saying. As soon as you do a projection, as soon as there is an actual definite value, that's where classicality comes in. 
I, I mean, this is the measurement I, problem. This is, this is the measurement I, problem. I totally <laughs> agree with that. But for me, there is a difference between, sorry, do you want to say something? Uh, maybe, uh, let me mention it in, in another simple terms. Suppose I have a screen and I cover it with electron detectors at every point. My point is if I'm doing a one electron experiment, whatever has happened to it, whatever it has interacted, whatever number of slits it has gone through, then I'm guaranteed that only one of those detectors is going to fire at a certain time. So it, it is whatever you might phrase in terms of entanglement with the screen, whatever it is, when you detect that electron which went out from your source and you detect it on the screen and have covered the screen with detectors, electron detectors at every point on it, it's only one which will fire. It'll never be that you'll, you'll have more than one. There is no splitting of that electron. And so this is why I always reduce it. I mean, you mentioned experiment in a couple of places. If I'm taking the, the, the final experimental question of what is it that you detect, you detect an electron only as a particle. This um, is a very interesting discussion, but I think we are yeah, right. okay. deviating yeah, a little bit from- Honestly, uh, I, okay. yeah, sorry, it's, so, right. uh, it's, an, so, it's an interesting debate anyway. I, right, it's a very interesting question. And, it is really and interesting. I think, I think both of you are, 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 are converging to the same, to the same point, so, so. And to be honest, I still disagree, but, but it's, it, I, I, I see both points and, uh, and both, both points of view, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a subtle debate, and I, I'm really interested on I'm, I'm like developing it on any other time when maybe we have more time here. Yeah. Right. So, is there any other uh, question or or comment uh, 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 for for this talk? Um, there is something. In the chat. Lex, uh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. No, and then there was a, there was something in the chat. Um, a text that like Mark. Well. Okay. Um, uh, so, if not, let's uh, thank Jose again and and. And I am looking forward to further discussions. Thank you. Thank you. thank you all for coming and thank you for inviting me. Um, it has been a pleasure. I hope that I was um, at least clear uh, to some extent uh, in the content of the talk. And yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to more discussions with anybody interested. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.